and the lady locked up, trained her up, and I've left her to the clinic while I'm here. <coughs> so I'm an oncologist for a uh, I've worked on the faculty of our pharmacy and oncology meetings over the last years, and I also work in Malaysia as part of the Affordable Cancer Medicines Program. And my job is to now summarize in 15 minutes all those slides from three hours of expert regulators because the biggest challenge comes after me. We have to persuade Prof. Javier, Prof. Chavez, that he has enough knowledge to tell Egypt's oncologists that OS similars are a safe and sensible thing to be doing for patients. And they have to know enough, those physicians, enough about biosimilars to be able to bring that confidence to patients. So we have to think, how do we summarize all that regulatory science in a way that gives confidence to ordinary people? And we like the challenge, don't we? So here we go. Those are my disclosures. As always, you learn more when you're teaching. So if you can think of a better way to teach something, always help me. So we're here for a very good reason. We think that drugs do have a capacity to do remarkable things for patients. I'm an oncologist like Prof. Why are we here? Well, the world of medicine is changing very fast. But at the moment, our biggest pressure on health budgets is specialist drugs. And within that, it's cancer medicines. And if there's a right for health, then there's a right to get effective medicines to our patients. So here's my agenda. I'm going to cover five things just to summarize this one. So you heard, first of all, what's a biologic therapy? Because biosimilars are just another version of a biologic drug. And you've heard that they come from living organisms or cells, and therefore they're very complicated. And just look at this. Remember how technology moves. Aspirin was once bio, was once biology. It was extracted from the bar of willow trees. And in time, we will make generics of all of these, but that just takes time. So, with increasing size, they're harder and more expensive. And our challenge now is to bring targeted therapy to cancer at an affordable level. And you've heard that every single process step in making these drugs could potentially create a new version of the drug. Not by altering the primary structure, the amino acid backbone, but the post-translational modification. Primary structure is the amino acid sequence. Secondary is the folding into the beta beta sheets or alpha helices. But you've seen this diagram before for the European Commission. There are points on each protein where you could alter the safety and efficacy of the drug by modifications that occur after the amino acid is translated. And that would create a different drug. Now we understand the source of this variation. Because every single person to date has told you biosimilars are similar but not identical. That is a phrase that was dreamt up for anti-biosimilar blood. So let's be clear. If I have a vial of biologic drug here, there is no unique structure. It's a mixture. Because biologic cells and tissues make mixtures. So this is red cell growth factor. There are four positions where I could add carbohydrates which could alter the shape and function of the molecule. Now, why is that important? For each site, there's about 20 sugars I could add, which means that in factorial design, there are 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 versions of this drug I could make from one primary structure. So the result is that this drug, even in its original form, is a mixture. And just very simple gels, isoform gels, will tell you this drug is not one structure, it's many. There is no unique structure of any biologic drug. Any biologic can only ever be similar. Which is why, although it's not correct for regulators to say it, every drug in time will become a biosimilar of itself. Biosimilar is a regulatory term, but we know what they mean. They're always similar, never identical. Now you've heard about manufacturing change. As drugs evolve, we want to make them better, most effectively, purer, longer shelf lives. 
So all drugs eventually will be re-engineered with a new process change. And that, I've told you, could alter the structure of the drug and therefore its function. Which means there's a second step. So the typical biologic drug sold in Europe has been through 11 different structural versions. And it's important, therefore, you heard from the regulators, that we can make sure that the drug works the same now as it did 20 years ago. So let's look at a drug that's important for leukemia and lymphoma called Rituxan. And you'll see that over time, batches bought with different batch dates showed micro heterogeneity of a key factor, the amount of glycans. Fucose will learn is a very important part. And then you can see, at this point, an entirely new structure of the drug is released by the manufacturer. It's been re-engineered, something we call a step change in an important characteristic. So that version of the drug has never been seen in patients before. This is a common. This looks at just monoclonal antibodies in Europe, and you'll see that there's a moderate to high risk that a manufacturing change would cause a new structure of a drug to be produced for pretty much every drug. The only one here that hasn't have never been launched at the time of this survey. So re-engineering drugs goes on the time. Some have had 50 versions since they were launched. Typically, 8 out of 10 biologics will be re-engineered every year. And for each of those three manufacturing changes, about three out of four could have a moderate to high risk of creating a new structure. So, similar but not identical is the phrase we will no longer use in our bias. The original and the biosimilar is identical. We know how to approve a originated drug. We want to show that it's clinically superior. We need a pivotal trial. That's the most important part. Powered to show it's better than what we've got before. And every time a new indication comes, a new pivotal trial is required. So once patents expire, we want copies of drugs to bring competition to lower prices, whether they're small molecules, generics, or biologics, as biosimilars. So generics, you've heard, really are based around analytics. If the drug substance is chemically identical, and the formulation means that it's released at the body at the same speed and with distribution, then you can predict, if the quality is good and the label is appropriate, that it will behave in a highly similar way. So this is the point about bioequivalence. These don't have to be identical, you can alter the formulation. But only two things matter, really, the structure of the drug and the pharmacokinetics. But I told you that formulation does other things for biologics. It doesn't just turn it from a fast release to a slow release version of renitinine. It can alter the safety and efficacy of the drug too. So let's just look, for example, at a tumor necrosis factor inhibitor, a wonderful drug for use in inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see that the structure of the drug can be altered by the disulfide bridges that help create those alpha and beta structures. And so let's just look at what happens if they're incorrectly created in a drug called etanostat, which we can use pretty simple X-ray crystallography to do. And you'll see that the potency of the drug decreases in proportion to the irregular disulfide bridges. So a 4% difference in that structure halves the potency of the drug. So formulation matters, it really does matter. Let's give you one more example before I stop. There's, we're going to talk probably about cancer therapy drugs, which will be antibodies. So monoclonal antibodies are a pretty good example. At one end, imagine I'm an antibody, this is where I bind the antigen. That's the recognition part. But the effector functions often work through my feet if I was an antibody so-called S region, the, fra the crystallizable fragment region. And what I can tell you, because we know so much about these structures, is that we can alter how this molecule works by some very small changes. At this position here, about just above my knee, 
which glucose we add there will profoundly alter the function of the drug. So if I remove, remove glucose, I turn it into a cancer cell killing drug with anti-dependent cytotoxicity. But if I add cyanic acid there, I can turn it into an anti inflammatory drug. And that can alter the potency 50 fold. So look, that's just two examples about why formulation matters more than just PK. And so the generic approach won't work because the PK and structural data is insufficient. We need additional data to show that it will be similar. So we need pharmacodynamic endpoints to pick up whether the structure has altered the function. You've also heard because of the need to switch drugs, we need to show that the immunogenicity does not increase. Remember, if the two drugs have the same immune profile, you can switch between them without loss of effect. The last thing we have to show is that safety and efficacy are similar. So how do we do it? And that's the job of the regulator through five key steps. Now remember, there's no requirement to prove the safety and efficacy again. We just have to show it's similar enough not to matter. There are two phases, analytics and clinical trials. Now, for a small molecule, it's easy. An identical drug substance with a similar formulation, giving a highly similar PK, predicts so well that you don't need clinical trials for most generics. For a biosimilar, the steps look the same, but they're more complicated. We can prove identical primary and secondary structure, but you can never entirely prove tertiary structure because each drug's a mixture. So what we have to show is that the biosimilar has variation within the variation of the original, that the variation is identical. If it doesn't, we have to justify that by another way to show it has no clinical consequence. We need to show that the biopotency is good because I could alter the sugar at this region of an antibody and alter its action by 50-fold. Then we move to patients and show that PK is similar. And if it doesn't, we have to show that has no clinical consequence. And we mandate clinical trials, you've heard, because you can't model immunogenicity in a mouse. Now, the most important step is the analytics. Because since these drugs were developed 20 or 30 years ago, the original, our ability to see into the drug structure has been transformed. And one of the key tools is mass spectrometry, which has increased in power in 20 years, 10 million fold. It's like going from this telescope to this one. Now imagine how much more you could see about a drug if you could see 10 million times better into the molecular structure of the drug. Because we can now detect a difference in 1 in 10 to the 11 molecules, which means we can map the structure and function of a monoclonal antibody and therefore copy it. And that pathway is what led to drugs that we now call biosimilars. It's a regulatory tool. Now I want to show you the power of giving you a better telescope or a better microscope. So here's a quiz to see if the coffee has woken you up. I'm going to change this picture, doubling the resolution every one second. The moment you can see what it is, just shout out what you've seen. Here we go. Two doublings was all it required. Now, further resolution tells you a bit about colour, but when you know what you're looking for, it's easy to see. And we know what we're looking for. These drugs have been around for a long time, and most of them have been through 11 different process changes already. So the tools we use to map out structure, I won't go into them, enable us to know so much about the molecule that we can tell you the structure and function of something like this. So these are the three best-selling cancer drugs in the world, and I can tell you which one it is. Which means I can copy it in a way that the body can't tell the difference. Now, the regulatory steps seem complicated. 
let's try and find a way that Prof. Amir can explain to his colleagues in the Oncology Society, because that's the hard job. We have to show that at each step, the biosimilar is comparable to the original drug. And I've told you that our first and most important step is the analytics. Then toxicology. Then the pharmacokinetics of pharmacodynamics, immunogenicity, we finish our clinical studies. And at each step, if the drug is comparable, that drug will be called, based on the totality of the data, a biosimilar. But the most important data, I've told you, is always the analytics. We had a question about which critical tests matter. And the answer is, it depends on each drug. Typically, there are about 60 to 100 characteristics, chemical features of the drug, that will predict its quality, safety, and efficacy that we will want to check. And remember, no drug is the same. So we have to track the structure of the drug and its function, that's biopotency, over time, which we know will never be identical, to map out the variation. Biologic drugs have 4D structure, 3D, and then they change over time. So here we are, this maps out the new variation that we believe to be acceptable in the originator drug. Which means if we create a copy with variation inside that, this drug will have the same clinical attributes as the drug before. Remember, these drugs are identical because we match the variation of the originator with the variation of the biosimilar. Now, if we're happy with those phases, we've said that the residual uncertainty needs to be tested clinically because formulation could matter. So this is about residual uncertainty and the better your analytic match, the less you need clinical trials. Such that we, at the Drug Investigators Association, I'm faculty on that, I asked the room full of experts, hands up, who believes in the future we can make biogeneric drugs? Just with analytics. Everyone put their hand up. I said, does anyone think we can do it now? They all put their hand down. But look at the pace of technology already. But here we are. We need these clinical studies because of the residual doubt before we approve the drug. And if we explain this to people for whom that's too hard, let me give you the simple explanation. Which key will open this lock? And the answer is, well, it depends. Does it depend on the color? Does it depend on the shape? No. Only some variation has a functional impact, and that is what we call a critical attribute of key function, and those are not critical attributes. Got it? Variation can be perfectly safe. So let's think about Prof. Amia, one of the drugs we expect to launch across the world in the next two years is a wonder drug for breast cancer called trastuzumab. One in five women with breast cancer have high risk disease that makes them die many years early. And access to this drug can restore them back to normal lifespans, which is wonderful. Can anyone tell me how many versions of the original drug have been sold since the first trials launched the drug? How many? Anyone got a guess? The answer, I've told you, the average drug has been through 11 versions, and this one has been through 52. Okay. Now, it's a wonderful drug. It's been tracked over 52. Let's show you what's happened at the 51st and 52nd versions. So remember, we're looking at structure to predict function. So what you find is this that we want to keep the function within plus or minus 20%. And I told you that the fucose sugar content was a big driver of the immunogenicity of the drug, which could be important to its mode of action. So you'll see an entirely new version structure of the drug was created with batches ending around 2018, 2019. And that dropped the potency of the drug to 50%. The 52nd version of the drug altered the mannose concentration and has brought some of the function back to that drug. 
Now, what I need to tell you is that no regulator in this room would approve that as a biosimilar. That's too big a step to do without comparative clinical studies. So in the end, does biosimilar regulation work? Because, you know, when I'm in a clinic and you say to a patient, I think you should use biosimilars, they're good for you, they'll save you money, it'll give us more money to look after you in the future. They want to say, well, doctor, is it a good idea? And what they really want to know is, would you use it yourself and give it to your family? So the answer is yes and yes. Because in the end, all of that science may be beyond many of us. But let's think of regulators as a black box. We don't know what goes on inside the black box, but we know that drug companies come with data, that the regulators are expert in looking at that data and they have questions backwards and forwards, and they make a decision, it's either a biosimilar or it isn't. And how good is that decision in Europe where this regulatory pathway was pioneered? Well, we now know. We've had 12 years of biosimilars with 38 approved and marketed and more than 700 million patient days exposure and these drugs are safe and effective. You can extrapolate them and you can switch them as part of a normal tender process. Every single one of those drugs after five years has to resubmit all the data. They've all been uh, reproved. So the answer is it works, but it, this is a caveat. Biosimilar is a regulatory term. There is no one test for a biosimilar. It's what a regulator says. And regulators in different parts of the world will call follow-on biologic drugs biosimilars when they have not been approved by this five-step pathway. So, for example, in India, you can buy biocopy drugs, which almost certainly will be in use in your country. These may not have been compliant with the current WHO European, American, Japanese pathway. And as you've heard, we correctly call these drugs intended copy biologics. People intended to copy them, but they didn't manage to compare all five steps of the regulatory process. So in summary, before we get Prof. Vermeer to do the really difficult job, these are drugs we need, but at cheaper prices. We really understand that formulation matters for biologic drugs, in a way that for generics will only alter the PK for most of them. We understand, therefore, that there is residual uncertainty that needs clinical trials, but with time, those clinical trials will get less important as analytics improve. The last part, how good is the pathway? Well, you've done a very sensible thing in Egypt, which is you've aligned yourself with the current WHO EMA pathway, which predicts biosimilars in Egypt will be just as safe and just as effective as they have been in Europe. Thank you.